Hello everyone, I'm Cheryl Crooks, Executive Director of Cascadia International Women's Film Festival. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion of the art of storytelling through the documentary. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the major media sponsor, KCTS, and Crosscut Magazine, the Mary Redmond Foundation, and the Washington State Arts Commission, and all of our sponsors, without whom this festival would not have been possible this year. Today's discussion about the art of storytelling through the documentary will be with director Larissa Lamb and Baldwin Chu, who made the documentary Far East, Deep South. They will be talking with Diana Chen, a Seattle writer, about how directors blend storytelling in the documentary form, how they approach their story, and how much pre-planning went into it, and what kind of things happened that came up during the documentary filming. So I hope you'll enjoy this discussion, and thank you so much for coming to Cascadia. All right, hi, Larissa, hi, Baldwin. Thanks so much for joining us in this, with this conversation. Um, so in addition to the co-producer partnership, you also have another partnership that isn't immediately apparent <laughs> in the film that I thought I just wanted to give you a chance to kind of share about how this uh, film um, came to be. Uh, yeah, she well, might be talking about us being- Married? Like, Oh, I was going to say, yeah, like roommates. But oh, yeah. roommates, married. But yeah, married, yeah. Married, yes, married, yes. Yes, married. I was going to say, the other partnership is we have a seven-year-old daughter. So that was, uh, you know, we made a film, we made a child. Actually, the child came first, then the film. That's true. But as, you know, other filmmakers may know, like making a film is like birthing a child. <laughs> and much longer, like child, nine months. This film, five years. <laughs> yeah. It's been, uh, what's been quite a while. We're in research and travel. Um, and I... I I also read that the, your daughter was in part an inspiration for the film also. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was, it, it all stemmed from seeing my father hold her for the first time. And I never had a grandfather experience before. And so I think when I looked at her and I was like, wow, that's, that's unique. I've never seen that in my family. And I think that really kind of sparked us to say, Hey, maybe we should do a little bit more research on, on our past, on our, on our well, my grandfather and great grandfather. Yeah. How did um, how did the film evolve, though, from a, initially a family project to a short film, Finding Cleveland, and then Far East, Deep South? What were the moments where you realized that it should be something else? And was it immediately or did it kind of more of a slower realization? <laughs> yeah, I had no idea what was going on when his brother first suggested, oh, let's go to Mississippi for, you know, um, your parents' 40th anniversary. I was like, okay. I mean, I, he had just told me that his grandfather and great grandfather were buried in Mississippi, and it just kind of went over my head. I always thought it was weird when we were doing wedding invitations that we didn't invite anybody from Baldwin's father's side of the family. And I said, does he want to invite anybody? And he's like, I don't know who to invite. I'm like, <laughs> okay. And I just didn't pry because it felt like, you know, a stone wall of information. Um, and so when we came to this point after our daughter was born, I'm like, okay, I guess we're going to Mississippi. I thought, you know, in, in, in Chinese tradition too, like paying respects to your, to your elders and ancestors is a very important component of our culture, right? So I just thought like, okay, we're going to go pay our respects. Sure, you know, now I'm part of the family, you know, his brother got married, we're all going to pay our respects. I had no idea what we would end up unlocking. In fact, our first job on our first trip was not to actually record. Her first job was take care of our daughter and make sure she stays out of the way so we could figure out where we're going and what we're gonna try to discover. Yeah, so at that point, I did not even have the director's hat. I was just a mom. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and then from there, I was just going to say from there, then you had asked about finding Cleveland. Um, when we got there and we stepped into that Chinese museum for the first time in the middle of Mississippi, you know, the, I was going, why is there a Chinese museum in, in Mississippi? And then I started looking around. All because of two people. Yeah, all sorts of two people. No. I'm like, I thought there were only going to be two Chinese men buried here. Oh. Why is there a whole population of Chinese that we never knew about? And and so the wheels started turning that this was an important story. But it wasn't until I think all those other personal discoveries of of the Bible and the people that we met and that I started to really feel like I felt like I was in a movie. So I felt why you not know, make why one? Make one? <laughs> uh, the story really needed to be told. On, and of course, from there, um, there was so much more beyond that first day, which is what our first short film was about, was just the first day. Mm -hmm. And as people see in, in Far East Deep South, there was a lot more story that we didn't even realize that even spanned us going back to San Francisco to the National Archives. Yeah, yeah. I love that. It is initially a personal story, but in some ways you also um, bring in the community of 
uh, Cleveland and Pace, um, and there's a collective story within that, those communities as well. Um, how did you go about doing the research there and building those connections? Um, you know, it, it's taken a few years to make this film too. Just curious about your research. Um, yeah, I mean, part of it is really that the community there is so small and tight knit and it really started from that first, you know, people heard that we were in town. In fact, it was weird because we thought we would be like kind of outcast because, you know, some Chinese people rolling into the South and they had no problem seeing Chinese people, but they had a problem. Well, not really a problem, but they were surprised to see Californians. <laughs> and so as soon as we arrived, all of a sudden word got out, there's this Californian family asking questions about their family. And then, so everyone just- Yeah, that's what we out. were labeled at. We were really surprised. Like we were labeled as the Californians. Californians. <laughs> Like yeah. that was stranger than us being Chinese American was the fact that we were Californians. Yeah. Before we knew it, everyone was, you know, giving us calls. We're getting emails. Hey, we might know something. We might yeah, know something. Yeah, after the trip, the first trip. And, you yeah. know, it was, you should talk to so-and-so and you should talk to so-and-so. And what we also realized is that a lot of the, the Mississippi Chinese ended up leaving the, the Delta over the generations and they fanned out to all across the United States. And so, you know, even in LA where we lived, like there was a lot of Mississippi Deltans here. Uh, yeah. In fact, one of them I knew since I was like a little girl and I had no idea he was from the Mississippi Delta. It turned mm -hmm. out he knew Baldwin's grandfather. So, you know, we, I always joke, it's like, they live among us. <laughs> we again, They're just never everywhere. knew their I know we just didn't know their story. And so it was pretty remarkable that we were able to mine so much information from people um, all around the country. Um, and mm -hmm. there, there have been other books and writings that, uh, you know, people had written like Dr. John Jung, um, who was featured in our film. He wrote a book, Chopsticks in the Land of Cotton, that really did a deep dive into the Chinese grocery stores and the families. Of course, he didn't know about our family at the time. So our family is not in his book. <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. Um, just being able to find those connections and also to get to know um, your grandfather through the perspectives of so many other people who knew about your, who knew your family and had those relationships. So that was just a really touching um, story that unfolded. But as you were making the film, you, um, you know, there, how did you make decisions when you weren't sure what you would find next or what, where the story would lead? How did you make those creative and uh, artistic decisions? Yeah, thank you for asking that because that is certainly the biggest challenge. You know, with documentary filmmaking, um, a lot of those decisions are made in in in, in the editing room, really, um, and you don't know what you have until you film it. I mean, as a filmmaker, you know, the first trip, we didn't know what was gonna happen. So it really truly was just uh, like, we only had the footage that we had. And of course, you know, we could go back and do some additional follow-up interviews. Um, and then of course, subsequent trips, um, we were inter able to interview a lot more people um, who were directly connected um, to Baldwin's family. But, you know, I thought we were gonna be done with the film when we went to Mississippi for the last time in like 2016, October. And and we've got these beautiful shots of cotton fields, Baldwin's, you know, walking through there and, and our, you know, and uh, he had a last stop at the gravesite just by himself and had all this pontification. I thought that was going to be like the, the final shot. And then we ended up at the National Archives in San Francisco and ended up finding the birth certificate and all these other documents. And I'm like, okay, my movie's not done. And so I ended up having to reframe the whole film because then it wasn't just about, you know, the Chinese and the Delta, but now it was really more about, um, our American identity and the sense of belonging and the fact that he finds out his roots have run several generations deep in this country, the story completely changed at that point. Mm -hmm. I think following along in those moments of surprise and discovery is just a really great experience for the viewer as well. Um, I think they, there are also just so many vulnerable moments too with your, um, with your dad, Bald, uh, Baldwin, and um, yeah, what I, what was that like in terms of balancing and uh, presenting that in the film too? Yeah, so um, my dad was not really vulnerable with me in front of him. He was <laughs> vulnerable with Larissa in front of him. Um, so actually, so, so the interviews with my dad where he's really talking and diving deep, those were the first times um, any of us have ever heard those stories. And actually Larissa kicked me out of the house uh, 
and say like, let me just take this, right? She said, yeah, because every time Baldwin would try to ask, even if we're like in the car or like, you know, just going somewhere, he tried to like get information out of his dad. He, his dad would just like give a one word answer. And then when, you know, when I got to sit with him, I was actually surprised because, you know, I, I knew he was camera shy. So I, I only ex expected to like sit down for like half an hour with him just to, just to know that he, I know he's not comfortable. So I said, okay, well just, let's just sit and talk for half an hour. That half an hour turned into two hours. Um, and even in a subsequent, um, you know, uh, session, you know, it, it was like a three hour conversation he had with me. And so, and even every time he's like, oh, I don't, you know, it's like, oh, this is too painful, you know, as a director, keep the camera rolling, keep the camera rolling. And he just kept talking. And I, I think a lot of it was just, he's never been able to share some of this. And I think some of it, he may, may have wanted to get off his chest. And, and uh, I, I appreciate him doing that. And there were definitely a lot of moments that we did not include where he's just sobbing on camera. Um, but I, I hope it, it was a cathartic experience for him as well and, and shed some insight into you know, his life and his journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how does he feel about the film today, if I may ask? <laughs> He feels better about it now that he's seen the whole thing. We I feel better about it now that he's <laughs> that he likes the film. Um, he's seen it actually several times, um, and I think he gets teary eyed every time he you know, relives it. It's because you never know. Like I don't know if it's painful to have to live, you know, relive some of the painful stories or not. But um, he he really is behind it. I think now that he knows that the Chinese Exclusion Act, especially, um, was a major factor in why his family was separated for all these years. Um, I think he's he's very uh, resolute in wanting us to get this story out there. He's still a little like, oh, I wish you hadn't put so much of me in there. But that was one of the editing decisions I had to make because earlier versions of the film, I knew he wasn't going to be comfortable and I was limited of what footage I had of him. So I didn't you know, put a lot of him in there, but everybody kept asking, what's Charles thinking? What's, you know, what's he feeling? He's so compelling. I want more of Charles Chu. And I'm, you know, and Baldwin's like, Okay, I guess put more of dad in there. <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't want Give to. the audience what they want. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I told him that like everybody, everybody thinks you're wonderful and they want to hear your story. So, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> uh, for, yeah, for a very personal family film too, I was wondering also how much input and feedback you got from family members along the way um, and how that we... impacted choices we there, pretty yeah. much yeah i only showed i showed an earlier cut to baldwin's brother edwin only because i wanted to make sure that dad was going to be okay with it before showing it to dad um to charles uh, baldwin's dad and so um you know edwin saw an earlier cut and he said dad's gonna love this i'm like okay i hope he's right <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, aside, aside from that, um, it was really us and we got a lot of input from, uh, you know, fellow filmmakers and, you know, um, other friends of ours from different viewpoints too. We really wanted to make sure we weren't just getting a Chinese American or even an Asian American perspective because we really wanted a film to reach a wider audience. And so, mm -hmm. um, which is why I appreciate Cascadia because there's such a diverse, you know, slate of films and, and filmmakers, you know, and and so I, I really wanted to get that insight. Um, and hopefully we made a film that people of, you know, every ethnic background and gender and even, you know, country of origin um, can relate to. Yeah, we weren't setting out to make an Asian American film or a Chinese American film. We were setting out to make an American film and a film that that encompasses a great piece of history that a lot of people don't know about, but and but yet significant. Right. And so it, it may have been little little known, but it's still significant. And we really wanted this to be an American story. Mm hmm. I think it definitely is capturing an important moment of history and also showing that impact within a very personal lens. Um, but also a communal lens too. Yeah, yeah the, that was the whole point is, um, I think, you know, I mean, there's a wonderful documentary, Chinese Exclusion Act, that that uh, dives deep, deep into the the particulars of the Exclusion Act, you know, how it happened, why it happened, what it, what, what it exactly was. But, you know, I think there are so many stories to be told and in it ours, like you don't normally get to hear and see the practical, application of what that Chinese exclusion or the consequences did. of it yeah and the mm -hmm. and, and the consequences and in Baldwin's case I mean he had no idea mm -hmm. you know I mean we you know he has a line in our film where it's like I you know I he, like he grew up in San Francisco Angel Island passed by it all the time and never knew that his family had actually been on Angel Island and that they were actually subject to the exclusion you know act so I think it was very eye-opening not just for our own family and, and but hopefully you know for for audiences everywhere 
Yeah, I think what we mm -hmm. wanted to do was not just retell or or lecture people about what the Chinese Exclusion Act was. Uh, we wanted people to identify with it and to understand that the laws had had repercussions and it affected people for generations. It affected families for generations. And I, we hope that when people see the film, they don't look at it as I'm the my family was the only one affected. You know. I want them to understand that there were thousands and thousands of families affected by this law and that in essence the Chinese Exclusion Act worked. It, it did exactly what it was set out to do. It, it excluded us uh, from this country and as we all know now it even excluded our history from our history books. So um, so it worked and there was, there was a lot of consequences to that and families were torn apart and we wanted people to understand that those were the ramifications. Yeah. I think there's also just, um, you know, advice people to think about their own local history too, uh, within Bellingham, for instance, um, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, Washington State, Pacific Northwest, I mean, there's this sadly a, a strong history of similar activities of discrimination and in, in the application of the ex, the Chinese Exclusion Act and other, you know, uh, very oppressive laws against the the Asians. Um, so I think it is it is worth people to continue to investigate because <clears throat> those are very important stories to be told uh, about what happened to the Chinese and, you know, driving out the Chinese in, in the Pacific Northwest. Mm hmm. Um, and I, I think in the, pre well, in the present moment too, you know, what are your hopes that, what message do you hope that people leave um, with? Uh, I really hope that people see how American we really are. I think a lot of the anti-Asian American things going on right now is really just anti-American. Uh, and it's people not understanding that we actually belong here. We're not perpetual foreigners. We've had history here. And I think a lot of, a lot of the things that's going on right now, unfortunately, is because people feel like we don't belong here, that we don't have a place in history. We haven't been discriminated against and we're just here um, as temporary people and not part of um, a permanent fixture in this country and not part of this country. Uh, I, I hope we hope that this film Americanizes all of us, you know, in a bit and, and yet still allows us to be who we are ethnically, you know, as Chinese and, and that that culture can bring beauty and diversity into this country. Yeah, just like this, this whole country is made up of immigrants, you know, just like somebody who's Italian American can can be proud of their Italian heritage, but yet be fully accepted as American at the same time, um, or someone who's Irish American, you know, we we too hope that films like this and discussions like this reframes the way people see someone with an Asian face, because generally the default is you see an Asian face, you must not be from here. Oh, you must not, you must speak with a foreign accent. And in our film, people speak with an accent that are Chinese, but they speak with a Southern accent. <laughs> you know and so i think that hopefully um makes people think a little bit differently every time they see someone who is of uh, an asian face that they don't automatically think like oh you must not be from here um and i what we really hope in the long term too is that we can broaden the way that u.s history is taught and our education system is more inclusive of the asian american experience because you know we're not trying to just add chapters to the history we're just trying to just broaden the sentences and paragraphs of things we already are learning, such as segregation, the American South, or if you extend it to other chapters of history, you know, of every w major war uh, in, in modern history, there have been Asian Americans that have been fighting. In fact, even all the way to the Civil War, we've learned that there were Chinese that were fighting in the Civil War. So we, the Asian community has been part of the fabric of America for so long, and we would like to see it just be told um, and not erased and, and included back in to our, our mainstream narratives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's um, there are stories that are excluded about how Asian Americans have contributed um, to different parts of American history, but also how they've, um, you know, how they've been part of other communities too. I think that the stories um, you uncovered in PACE were really touching and also just showed um, community supporting each other. Yeah, I yeah. think that was very important for us, um, you know, showing the relationships between the, the black and the early Chinese communities there and some of the symbiotic relationships, the need for each other. Um, it wasn't just fighting against a system. It was fighting for each other. It was fighting with each other to, to be with each other and to have fighting like, together, together, not fighting yes. against each yeah, other. Yeah, not against that's, 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 <laughs> that's what I was trying to say. Fighting together yeah. <laughs> to survive. <laughs> yeah. And it's just it was it was great to finally get 
the perspective from the black community. Um, we had heard those stories from the, the Chinese community. We've heard it from the white community, but we wanted to hear it from the black community. And when we went there and we actually, you weren't, we weren't even sure what we were going to expect when we first got yeah, there. Yeah, we, we, we did it. And uh, we didn't know if they would feel like, oh, those Chinese, they were taking over our neighborhoods because that's the sentiment in a lot of major cities today, um, especially coming from LA. Um, and we were pleasantly surprised. We were welcomed with open arms. Um, and it, mad it, it, was, it mattered to them that Baldwin's grandfather and great grandparents had the store in the town and, and you know, they, they appreciated the fact that um, the Chinese were able to, to provide a, a safe place for people to shop. Um, and they were their neighbors um, and they, they would partner and barter with each other. And they would even, you know, do things together and work together and, uh, you know. Go to the and, movies together and sit together in the movie theater, right? Yeah, I, and, and so it was just such an amazing um, revelation that, I, you know, we want more people to know about, you know, yeah. we know. <laughs> It's not that rosy in every chapter of history and in every region of the country, but certainly I hope we can take the positive lessons for, to being more neighborly, um, especially for communities of color who, who are struggling. And even today, you can see yeah. in the news, we are struggling and we, and we need to, we can't, we can't do this alone, either, you know, either of our communities. Um, we have to do this together. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, what were some other surprising discoveries along the way? And, this, you know, um, this can be on the personal level too, if you're willing to share any of the extras or bonuses from your sure. research that were uh, removed or cut out from editing. Yeah. Well, um, something new came out and, and kind of expanding on the story that we just talked about with the Black and, and the Chinese experience. We learned more about more partnerships. We found out that um, you see in our poster, there's a African-American gentleman there. And we had this photo for a very long time. In it was family. in your family photos with, you know, all the other family mm -hmm. treasure keepsakes right. that we had. We're like, Who, who's, this, who's this Who's this guy? And, you know, you wouldn't just take a picture. I mean, photos were hard to take back then. So you don't just take a picture of any random. And keep random, it of a random it, person. Right? And so this guy something. must have been significant to our family. Turned out that he was a farm worker, a uh, farm owner. Um, his name is Hosey Collins and he owned a farm a couple miles away from Pace and he ended up also helping out at my grandfather's store and they apparently we found out from the black community that finally hunted down some information and told me um, that he they, they basically worked together and then Baldwin's grandfather helped Hosey on his farm so um, you know they were friends and they helped each other with both their 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 businesses and um, we just thought it was a beautiful you know, relationship. I mean, it's sadly, we only found this out, you know, recently, and we would have loved to have included more of that in the, in the film. Um, but, you know, there were some things like that, where we didn't get the answers in the course of making our film. But, um, you know, I'm glad we got to have a, a few, a few more answers. Uh, but we also just had a lot of stories from the Chinese like that, that we wish we could have included from the, the Chinese uh, that lived in the Delta. Um, you know, all the stories about like how they had to, you know, hand pick all the, the package, the, the groceries. Like we take for, you know, we take for granted today, like everything is just instant, you know, pack prepackaged. You know, they were, the, all the kids had to learn how to make change at a young age, you know, you know, all the family members worked and they lived in the store and, um, they all had to to just grind it out, and they oh, and they had like deliveries, like the, they would have bicycles. Yeah, you um, think it's like a new thing? Oh, groceries delivered? No, they. Were I know <laughs> they were doing it back then, before the pandemic. Way back, it's like it's all like retro now. It's like going back in the olden days. They did deliveries back then um, because a lot of the farm workers like they couldn't come to the store, and so I remember you know Harold Lum would, would say like, yeah, we had like an ice block and like a truck, um, and then we like drove it out to deliver groceries <laughs> to our customers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And even stories from the older people, you know, they're talking about, especially on um, the World War II days, you know, we had some great stories about um, the early Chinese in Mississippi, which had one of the largest populations of Chinese that actually enlisted into the into the military to join World War II. And Pap Pang, who's Pap not Pang. in our film, but he was 100 at the time, um, and he's passed since, God bless him. But he was a little hard of hearing, and doing an interview was a little challenging, and, and also asking him questions like, Uncle Pap, what branch of the uh, military did you serve in? Well, Hitler and Stalin, and he would go off on his World War II stories. <laughs> <laughs> which were incredibly informative and entertaining, but because we were focused on Baldwin's family story, yeah. we were not able to include. 
-hmm. But hopefully one day we can kind of put together some of those other oral histories that we collected um, into a different project because there were so many wonderful stories. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine it'll be a great contribution to the Chinese Heritage <laughs> Museum as well. Yeah. Yeah. And they might have a lot of those stories already. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So how many trips did you do total to Mississippi? Uh, we did about five or six trips total. Yeah. We did. Yeah. Um, so through the, ma the the magic of movie making, you know, we it looked like just a few. Yeah, it, <laughs> it didn't look like that many, but it was it yeah. was actually um, more that, you know, some of it was for research purposes. Um, but, you know, we we spent a lot of time in Mississippi. I ne we neither of us had been to Mississippi prior to that first trip. And now I feel like it's like a second home. Yeah. And we also made trips to obviously San Francisco and Sacramento and you know, tried to locate some of the other people that had left um, Mississippi so we can continue to get the interviews because not everyone continued to live in Mississippi. So um, we made a lot of trips, but um, we are looking forward to going back out there. I, I love Southern cooking, you, you know, even though it's not healthy because every, everything is fried and has like gravy <laughs> on it, but it's so good. Oh, one, one fun fact is uh, the, the trip that we went to go meet LaVon Jackson, Mayor LaVon Jackson, for the first time, it was incredible because they were having a big celebration in pace that day when we happened to show up and everyone was out and they were right on the same property as my great grandfather's store, grandfather's oh, wow. store. It was a big cookout. It yeah. was, it was Ribs, great. Ribs, party, dancing. And had a, the stage that you see in the film. The, There's the, a flatbed the truck flatbed in there. The flatbed truck turned into a stage. And uh, we may not have mentioned it before, but we're actually musicians. Yeah, so, we're both music artists. They they jokingly call us like the Asian Jay Z and Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> so we did our they, we did our thing. We they they had us go up on that platform, uh, that that flatbed and on stage, and we performed in front of the entire town of Pace on the property that used to be his grandfather and that, great grandfather's store. I, yeah. I'm like wow. getting like a little teary eyed thinking about it because it's all kind of come for, full circle for yeah. us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Mayor Jackson uh, invites us to his house, which is right behind the city, hall. the city hall, which is right across the street from the it's property. A small town. It's a small town. <laughs> and he's got like a whole spread of, of ribs and corn cooked. and everything, right? And Southern was, hospitality is it's real. A, it's a real it, thing. It really it's is. It's a real thing. Yeah. How did you guys feel as the Californians um, meeting this new culture of the South? Oh, I miss, I wish I could be go there more often. <laughs> right. I mean, I think we're so used to our fenced off lives here in the, you know, in California and, and the city. And, and there is something about Southern hospitality, even though we joke about it. Um, and I, I, I truly appreciate the, the salt of the earth, you know, vibe of people there. Um, and I, I just, you know, I hope we can learn from those lessons as much as like the, the history is painful, uh, uh, slavery and discrimination and, and segregation. Um, it, the people that ho I hope we reflect in the film, you know, we can take those lessons that honestly today we're so divisive in so many ways, but if we can get back to that human relation and relating to one another as a neighbor, um, I think our country and our world would be better for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think right now there are also a lot of regional and urban rural divides that this, um, that this film bridges so nicely too. So you, you mentioned that you also uh, are musicians and is wondering about the decisions you brought into um, the film from that perspective as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, first of all, um, I even though I've composed music for film in the past and TV, I made the very wise decision to bring on my good friend um, Nathan Wong, who is a world class composer <laughs> who's worked on major, major projects, won two Emmy Awards. Um, and he's Chinese American. And that was a, a major factor. I wanted a Chinese American composer um, to be part of it because I've known in the past as a composer, I've been told to make things more Asian, even though we're I'm doing like an American story. Um, and, and I wanted to Make sure I had a composer who was sensitive to not make things sound too Asian. Um, and then I, I, we brought in some authentic, um, you know, regional music in terms of Steve Azar, um, who is actually of Lebanese descent. And there was a, a huge Le Lebanese population as well in the Mississippi Delta um, that people don't know about. And he uh, does Mississippi, Mississippi Minute. Minute. Uh, and another Chinese American um, artist named Kevin So, who does um, the song Our America at the end of our film. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted again, we don't, Asian American artists don't get an opportunity a lot of times to have their music featured in films. And so I, I really wanted to kind of have mm -hmm. 
those artists and somebody named Only One. Only One. This guy <laughs> rapping in Chinatown. Um, and my song is at the end credits. Of <laughs> yeah, I think I saw you as a, on a, as a credit yeah. there. Yeah, a lot so, easier to get licensing from yeah, the both of us. Knowing the <laughs> And, and more importantly, I mean, with, with his song, it wasn't just the nepotism or the, the being married, but it, I really felt like the lyrics of the song fit the moment and what I was looking for. And so he actually was like, not so like, are you sure you want to put my song in there? I'm like, I think it's great. I think it's, it boosts the energy of that, of that scene very much. And, and I, I, I felt like that was very important. So, um, uh, I, I took a personal hand in choosing all the music. I didn't hire a music supervisor just mm -hmm. because that's my background. And so I was very much hands-on with that. That seems like an area where I feel like family may have a lot of different opinions though about the music and the songs that you include. Especially his dad who hates rap music and they <laughs> agree to disagree and still love each other even though, you know, and that was actually a, a plot point at one point where I was going to explore the con the conflict between the rap and no rap. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you end up like going from, uh, I think Baldwin had mentioned the babysitting role earlier to taking on directing this film? Like, yeah, well, I think once I decided that, I decided, I suggested that we should do a film, um, the, we, we ended up hiring um, an editor, you know, Dwight Bueller, who ended up working with us on the feature as well, and for the short, and Baldwin and Dwight tried their hand at doing a first cut. And I said, oh no, this is, this is, this is not, this is not working. So I said, all right, um, let me give my, let me, let me take my hand at this and um, we got what we got. And, and that's how I ended up, I kind of accidentally fell into the director's role, even though I directed plays in the past and I'd worked a little, I've done pro television production um, for many years as well. And so it just felt like a natural fit for me to, to do it um, and tell the story. And um, I'm glad I was able to, to do it in a way that is resonating you know, with people. So um, you know, definitely you're, did a you're, better never, job. you're never too old to, I guess, transition into another career. <laughs> Um, storytelling in film is is actually a lot like storytelling in music. You know, um, I think good songs, um, there's a beginning, a middle, and end, and a good story. And I think you know, in in film, recognizing that it, there's there's an arc, um, there are characters, and and the story elements are are in a sense uh, very similar. I'm so curious about your process too in organizing uh, the story while it was, you know, transforming and changing over time. There were a lot of post-it notes. I had a virtual bulletin board of like post-it notes um, that my editor and I are working off of trying to, you know, puzzle, put this big puzzle together. Um, and then later on, we, we literally brought out the post-it notes and, you know, in, in the editing, you know, office, like on the, on the, on the wall, there were about almost a hundred post-it notes and then we kept oh, shifting least. around at least um, so many of them that we had to shift around because it was, hopefully it looks like it was effortless, but it was not effortless. Let me tell you, putting this story together. Uh, we thought it was going to be about, um, you know, just all the revelations. Um, and, and ultimately, and we realized it was really about Baldwin's dad's journey. It was his journey reconciling his past with, um, you know, his life now, um, and also their journey as father and son together mm -hmm. in discovering all this. Um, so we're, we, you know, we, we hope everyone enjoyed that. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll be telling more stories to come, hopefully. Yeah, it did feel very effortless and compelling and just, um, yeah. Very yeah well, and, and certainly, and certainly if people want to continue to follow our journey, they can go to our website, fariesdeepsouth.com to subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media. We're on Instagram at Far East Deep South and on Twitter at Far East Deep So because we ran, ran out, out of letters. Of letters. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we have some major announcements coming down the pipeline. Um, so, and our film is also available for licensing um, for, for education. Um, that's, as we mentioned, our major platform is getting our film into more schools and to universities. So if your university has Canopy, um, and if it doesn't, you can go to newday.com as well to find our film. Um, we'd love to bring it into um, more schools and hopefully um, broaden the way education is talked about to be more inclusive of the Asian experience. Yeah, how has this film impacted your daughter's perspective of her uh, place in U.S. history? I think that yeah. just having seen this film as a child would be really impactful. Well, she's like a little historian now. She loves history. She tells people about our past. She talks about other people's history. Um, and that was really important for us because I know that, you know, when I was growing up, people would make comments to me. And if I had known my own family's history, back in high school and junior high, 
um, the way I would have reacted would have been so different. And so I really didn't want my daughter to have to go through those same, um, those same things when he, when she gets older, you know, I, I hope that she doesn't get the same type of comments that I had when I was younger, but if she does, I want her to have a good comeback. I want her to really know her history, know her Do family. you know how long my family has been in this country? <laughs> I'm sixth generation American. No, that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> it. No. Um, I, you know, and honestly, you know, we, we all talked about that. I'm the daughter of immigrants. Um, my parents came over, they were born in China, came over via Hong Kong to the United States. So in my mind, again, you know, we're an immigrant family. I was always labeled as such. I saw myself as such, even though I was born in this country and I was the first one born in this country, you know, there was always still this, this sense of like when my parents said like, oh, the Americans, they weren't talking about us or when other people talked about Americans, they weren't talking about us. And so um, for our daughter, we wanted her, we, we want her to know, and she's been brought up to know that, yes, you are American. You are also have a very strong Chinese heritage, but you are American. And, you know, like Baldwin said, she's reading every biography on under the sun. She knows more about, I think, history now than, you know, I, def I definitely did you know at at her age and and so it, it's not even just um you know american history she's like learning about world history too she actually asked me once like mommy can you show me a video about world history i said how much time do you have <laughs> she wants to know it all <laughs> that's great what uh yeah what a great experience for her to um follow the story as it unfolds and to have this film later in life Absolutely. And that's really our hope is that this film sparks others to investigate uh, not just your own personal family history, but other history that hasn't been told and in turn tell your stories and tell history and share the history because I think we're all the better and richer for it. The more we know about different people, different culture and different chapters, even if they're painful chapters in, in history, um, so that we're just all enriched uh, to relate to one another better. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you, Baldwin. <laughs>